So, Dr. Ken, we are here at the New York Spine Surgery and Rehabilitation Medicine Center, your office in Poughkeepsie, New York. This is where the magic begins. So tell me, what happens when a patient comes through these doors? When a patient walks through our doors, they are in terrible pain. They're really suffering. And so we try to wrap words around their problems and try to really understand what's going on. We do a history, a physical examination, then we do an MRI and x-rays to see what's going on within the spine. What would you say are the most common back issues? Lakshmi, we have a saying that world citizens are bold, world citizens are beautiful, world citizens are brave. They behave as though they have a spine, but they do not know what this means. So people are just not aware that they have a spine. They're not aware that they have beautiful spine joints that need to be taken care of. And they're not aware that they have nerves and other parts of the spine that just needs to be taken care of. So they don't know their spine? That's correct, yes. Well, Dr. Ken, you have this beautiful spine in front of you. Why didn't you tell our viewers a little bit about their spine? The spine is uh, a combination of 24 pairs of beautiful and very precious joints. And these joints are very important. Every motion Every motion in, in your neck and back is through a combination of these joints. And people are not aware that they have these joints, and so they don't know how to take care of them. And then uh, people need to be aware that they have nerves that exit at every single level, and these nerves carry information all about the body, brings information and carries information. The spine, spinal cord and nerve roots are how the body communicates with the brain. Dr. Ken, how do we take care of the joints and how do we take care of the nerves? To take care of the joints, you need to provide motion. So for example, in the neck, Lakshmi, you can do flexion, extension, side bends, and tilts. And so when you're doing that, you're moving those joints and they just feel better. Another way to take care of the joints is to do yoga. And when you do upward dog and downward dog, or maybe the cat cow, when you do the positions of yoga, you're really moving and really using these spinal joints. Is this something we should do every day? So you should do it in the morning when you get up and when the spine joints get going. Boy, your range of motion, flexibility, and your feel good gets going as well. In the middle of the day when you're having a lull at work, that's another great time to do it. And sleep is such an important phenomenon. You should prepare for sleep by doing these stretches. Tell me about cracking your back or cracking your neck. Is that good? Is that bad? Uh, this is actually good. See, people are just not aware that their joints need to move, and so they don't move them. And then when they hurt, then they move them and they hear the cracking. But the cracking is no different from when the knuckles are cracked. It's just the joints moving. And in this case, it's the joints begging to move. So the more you move them, the less they'll crack, and the more range of motion you'll have, and the better you'll feel. Dr. Ken, someone who's a smoker, does this affect their back? Oh, absolutely. So what smoking does is it constricts the arteries by the spine, and it sends more blood to your brain. And so you're feeling more oxygenated, and you're feeling better, and you're having a better moment. But what happens at the level of the spine, when the arteries are constricted and there's no blood supply, it's easier to crack the disc spaces. And from one crack, you can get two cracks and three cracks. But then if you combine that by helping to build, build a house, or a jackhammer a friend's driveway, or do something with aggressive bending, lifting, twisting, reaching, then you can get inflammation and permanent destruction. So yes, smoking does affect the spine. It destroys it. So, viewers that are looking at this, and if you're a smoker, it's very important. You're going to damage your back. Please stop. <laughs> Dr. Ken, talk, let's talk about breathing. I mean, in yoga, we, we spoke with Dr. Griffin, and you know, she explained how yoga is optimal for spinal care. Let's talk about breathing. How important is proper breathing for our spine? Breath is important for life. 
And there are hundreds of studies that say that if you do deep belly breathing, you take a deep breath and fill up your lower belly, your chest, and your upper chest, that your whole chemistry changes. If you're massively depressed, if you're minorly depressed, it just gets better. And your whole body chemistry changes, so breath is so important. Breath is important in the spine in that when you're taking deep breaths, the spinal nerves are moving in the channel better. And so when the nerves move, it's called nerve mobility. And this is so important, and you, the nerves feel better. They're physiologically better. Sometimes nerves get stuck down. Let's say you had a previous surgery and there's a scar and the nerve is stuck, it's not moving. Then I would need to come in and surgery and remove the scar and help that nerve to move again. And patients typically do better with that. They're usually a lot better. Now, Dr. Griffin also spoke about health and exercise. And one thing she briefly mentioned about was obesity. Does obesity affect one's back? There is a recent study that showed the relationship of obesity and back pain. So for moderate obesity, the study found that if you spend two hours around your house just doing things like cooking, cleaning, running up and down stairs, folding clothes, that there was a metabolic shift and just two hours of this light activity diminished the risk of you having significant back pain, about 33%. And then if you took it to the next level and you started doing things like gardening or ballroom dancing or just like jogging, you diminish your risk another 15 to 20 percent. And that's quite astounding. But even more absolutely astounding is the severely obese, the morbidly obese. So when they took, they studied the morbidly obese patient and they did just 1.3 minutes of vigorous exercise as much as they can, they drop their risk of back pain another 30%. And if they did an extra minute, they dropped it another 15 to 20%. So the studies are saying if you're obese and you want to diminish your risk of back pain, just get going. Just start uh, walking, uh, getting around your house, cooking, cleaning, then maybe go outside and ballroom dancing and, uh, and jogging and incrementally you will get better and definitely you will diminish your chances of having back pain. Dr. Ken, I know you have performed over 3,000 surgeries in about a 20 year span. What is one surgery that really touched your heart? Lakshmi, all surgeries are really heart touching. So you're really dealing, that's one thing when a patient's in jail or a patient's incarcerated. It's a different thing when the spinal cord and nerve roots are just so tight and incarcerated that you can't move or you can't take a breath without pain. And so surgeons come in, we come in and we free up the canal, we open up the canal and patients feel better. So it's really a lifestyle of, of great moments. But the time that's most special to me is really the Helen Daniels story, and I have her permission to mention her name. Helen uh, came to me at 100, and her boys brought her in. She was not walking for a month. And so we fixed two fractures by putting cement into the bones. Very simple operation after really doing an elaborate workup to make sure that she could undergo this surgery. And she walked again. And she lived another four and a half years, and we were very close, and I loved Helen. She's probably my most special patient. Dr. Kent, let's talk about the operating room. When you're going in for a surgery, I mean, what are some things that you have to prepare for, and what are you expecting when you go into this operating room? When we're going in for surgery, I need to be very clear as to what the problem is. And we do this with MRI scans and CT scans and so on. And we know exactly where the problem is, where the constriction is, or what level needs to be stabilized, or which level needs to be re-cleaned up, and so on. So we're clear on what the problem is. And we're clear on what we need in surgery, we, we're clear on what instruments we need, which assistance we need, and so on. So the technical aspects we're very clear on. 
What you may not know is that on the morning of surgery I do an elaborate prayer so that my hands are divinely guided and that I would not or I'd never hurt someone. Tell me about a neck surgery. So neck surgeries are very special. So typically patients come in and they have pain in the neck and radiating down the arm in one zone or another. And so we get an MRI scan and we find out what the obstruction is. This is not yet an indication for surgery. Or very rarely do patients go immediately for surgery. So what we do is we send them for conservative care, which could be physical therapy or pain management or Reiki or acupuncture. So many things to see if we can calm the nerve down. And if the nerve is calmed down, then there's no need for surgery. But if the nerve doesn't calm down, then we need to clean up that segment. So what I do is I take the patient to the operating room and the anesthesiologist does a, an elaborate set of monitoring lines then he puts the patients to sleep. And so when he puts the patient to sleep, then um, I prep the patient and I make an incision in the neck, right, in the crease of the neck. So we make an incision in the crease of the neck and then we use distractors to get down to the spine. At the level of the spine I take what's called pituitary rongeur and I remove the intervertebral disc between the two vertebral bodies. So when I remove the disc even though you think we're done cleaning up that's not so. Then I use a drill and I drill the end plates of the bones above and below very cleanly so I could see squarely back into the vertebral body to make sure I'm not leaving any obstruction so we make sure the nerves are free and then when I'm certain that it's clean then I put a bone plug which holds the nerves in the correct position allows them to be free and from time to time we stabilize the segment with the plate. Yeah. Well Dr. Ken I understand that you were the orthopedic consultant for Darren Aronofsky's production of Black Swan. I mean tell me about that. How did this opportunity emerge for you? Well. Darren Aronofsky's group reached out to me to help them to make the orthopedic construct that was used in the movie. So if you remember in The Black Swan, very early in the movie, the old queen was deposed and she ran out and was hit by a taxi. And you saw her in bed with a three-dimensional orthopedic construct. And that was mine, so I made that. And I learned more than any of the services I provided to Aronofsky's group, I learned to look at how they work so precisely and laboriously reshooting everything until it's perfect. And I learned, and with, it's with this vision I wrote Keys to an Amazing Life, so I would not allow a single page to go unless it was perfectly shot. So I'm really grateful to the team, it was a great experience. Would you participate in future movies? Absolutely, it's fun, it was really fun too observe the craft. Dr. Ken, there are a lot of youths pursuing careers in the sciences. What advice would you give them? So, the young people come to me and they ask me how do I become excellent in the future? And so, the first thing I tell them is not to choose any single one area. I tell them it's a moving future. Whatever you see, respect, and so desire today will change tomorrow and then will change again. So I say develop pathways of excellence. Be really, really ready with excellence. So I tell them to be fit like a professional athlete. I tell them to be able to type as fast as you're thinking so you can be a great writer. I tell them to read voraciously, read 40, 50, 60 books a year. And I tell them to develop mentors. I've been so fortunate and so blessed that I've had so many great mentors that have guided me and helped me and showed me pathways of excellence. And for our viewers that are looking at Let's Talk with Lakshmi today, what advice would you give the community about spinal care and, and taking care of yourself on an everyday basis? My advice to my patients is to pay attention to five strategies. So I tell them that good posture is most important. I tell my patients that posture is king and all of the studies show that 
in good posture, you, your internal chemistry changes. And there's so many good attributes. Then I tell them to make sure that they take deep breaths all day. Engage in deep belly breathing and I show them all the goodness of it by the hundreds of studies. I show my patients how to do the mobility exercises to do the flexion extension side bends and so on of the neck and also of the lower back and I recommend they do it in the morning in the middle of the day and before they go to sleep as a way of preparing to sleep better. Then I show them uh, strategies for strengthening so I tell my patients that they do 25 push-ups a day, which is just a minute of work. It's 9,000 in one year. And if they do a minute of plank a day, they would have a phenomenally strong core, along with a minute of partial sit-ups, not full sit-ups. I recommend for them to do five minutes of aerobic activities. Also, I show my patients the studies of meditation, and I recommend 15 to 20 minutes a day the studies in meditation are showing that with just eight weeks of meditation your frontal cortex actually grows by MRI scans and your amygdala, the reactive emotional brain, becomes smaller. So that's the routine that I recommend for my patients. Dr. Ken, I mean we all know that you are from Guyana and Let's Talk with Lakshmi is also aired in Guyana. To our viewers back home, maybe some people from West Coast where you're from, what message would you give to them that are looking at a, a young man that came here when he was 12 years of age and today now he's a successful spinal surgery in America? The message I would give to my community and I was born on the west coast of Guyana in Demerara which is one of the most remote spots on planet earth. The message I would give is one of recognition. It seems that these remote areas are talent hubs for people that are really hungry to do really wonderful things. And there's so many people that have come out of these areas that are doing great things already. For someone aspiring to do excellent work, I would remind them that the studies show that it takes 10,000 hours, which is about 10 years of practice, to be able to operate at a master's master level. You are. I mean, I follow you on Facebook. I get your wonderful morning messages. I follow all your books, all of your um, conferences, your meetings, your launches. I mean, you're really out there doing a wonderful thing for yourself and, of course, for our West Indian community. And I'm very proud and very honored to have met a man of yourself of great esteem, a brilliant man, a brilliant surgeon. Well, thank you for all those kind words. I'll try to live up to them. <laughs> well, Dr. Ken, it was wonderful visiting you, coming down here at the New York Spine Surgery and Rehabilitation Medicine Center. Um, we loved visiting your home, meeting with Dr. Griffin, your wife. And from the crew of Let's Talk with Lakshmi, cast and crew of Let's Talk with Lakshmi, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Lakshmi. Come again. Thank you. You're welcome.